What's up, everybody? Welcome into Flippin' Bats, where today we have a great guest joining us, uh, a return friend of the pod, Bernie Williams, an absolute legend of the New York Yankees. His number is retired there. Going to ask you all about the day his number got retired. And of course, some great stories. I love having legends on and, and sharing stories of the game. He's got some great Derek Jeter stories, Don Mattingly, Willie Randolph. That's going to be a lot of fun, as well as the current state of the New York Yankees. What happened last year? Where do they go from here? Uh, the young stud, Jason Dominguez, being on the team. Uh, are they possibly going to sign Shohei Otani? I ask all about where he thinks he's going to go, what he should prioritize, as well as uh, IPF. His father passed away from a lung disease in 2001, and he shares that story and talks all about what he's doing today um, to, to share that story and to talk all about it and to raise awareness. So this ends up being a really fun conversation. I hope you all enjoy it. So without further ado, let's welcome in New York Yankees legend, Bernie Williams. Fly ball onto the track, at the wall, it's gone! Home run! Turns on a ball, deep right field, and gone! What a game, what a moment. All right, and pumped to welcome again back on Flippin' Bats, Bernie Williams. Bernie, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, I, I got to ask, it's something I, I always wondered with you and, and about you and your career. You played your final game in Major League Baseball in 2006. Didn't officially retire, though, until 2015. Is there a story behind that? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it was just, you know, me being a, a little bit of a brat. Because <laughs> uh, my, my exit, you know, as is customary with, uh, you know, a lot of players, uh, you probably don't end up in the best possible terms. Uh, didn't really get a luxury to have a, 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 a goodbye, goodwill tour <laughs> with some of my teammates. So I think at that time I was like, okay, uh, I'm just going to leave the door open for a while. And then just I just kept procrastinating and go, going into other things. And I kind of <laughs> forgot, hey, I'm not playing anymore. Maybe I should officially retire at some point. I mean, what a career it was ultimately that ends up in your number 51 getting retired by the New York Yankees. What do you remember most about that day, Bernie? Uh, retirement day was very special because that was one of the last things that my mom was able to see uh, when she was alive. And uh, she already had, uh, you know, kind of like the hints of uh, senile dementia, but she was she was present that day. Uh, she did not get intimidated by looking at th that whole crowd and that uh, she was so happy. Uh, it felt like uh, all the efforts that her and my dad had done to get me to that point were sort of, uh, uh, it, it had come forced full circle. And uh, uh, I knew that she was very proud of me and uh, I was just happy to have her there and my whole family and my brothers, you know, my, 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 uh, you know, my kids. Uh, it, it was just a very, very special day. How much did your mom and dad mean to the success that you had in your career? Everything. There's no question about that. You know, they uh, had us when we then when the, when they were a little bit older in their life. You know, like late thirties. You know, yeah. Uh, and they really committed. You know, their whole life to raise us uh, the right way. Um, I, I attribute uh, a lot of things. You know, that I am as a, as a person now to my dad and my mom. They had a great combination. Uh, you know of. Uh, personalities my dad was outgoing and kind of like a, the wild card my mom was very methodical and academic you know she was uh uh the uh, uh the the educator uh she was a school principal for for uh, uh almost 40 years in the public education system in puerto rico my dad was a merchant marine and he just was in every port you know for like 10 20 years uh making his life you know overseas and uh that combination kind of gave us the best uh, uh combination the best uh, of both worlds if you if you speak that's really cool bernie another guy that uh just got his or has his number retired for the new york yankees Derek jeter a new teammate of ours here at at fox and just spent a ton of time on the road with him for alcs and world series he's always around and I got to ask, do you have, when I ask you about a Derek Jeter story, do you have a favorite Jeter story that comes to mind? Well, I have uh, I have too many. Uh, probably 75% of, of them I cannot say. I'm not <laughs> there to say in public. Uh, but 
Uh, nothing bad, nothing bad. Just kidding around. But I am uh, uh, do have a lot of uh, great memories of of him. You know, the fact that he, we, even though he's a little bit younger than I am, we all locked, uh, we all looked uh, up to him, to his leadership, and uh, you know the way that he, uh, you know, handled being the captain of the team for all those years. Uh, he really made a point to answer every call to address every person that, that you know, like he was an equal. Uh, he didn't, uh, you know, put himself above anybody. Uh, he had a great support system that was kind of admirable to see with mom and dad going there all the time. Uh, and uh, he, uh, you know, he uh, was just a great teammate. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was just reminded of this, you know, we, we had a, an opportunity to spend a lot of time on the plane and I would just sit right behind him. And uh, on an any given day, he, you know, I always brought my guitar with me uh, to play music. And on any given day, I will have them uh, kind of sit in and, and play a couple of tunes. You know, he had a great falsetto. So he would do like a little <laughs> Michael Richie, uh, you know, of some sorts. But most of the time he was just trying to tell me to shut up because he wanted to sleep. <laughs> Wait, so sometimes he'd join in though and start singing along? Yeah, he would he would start singing along. I mean, he doesn't really have a bad voice for for, <laughs> for baseball player. Uh, but uh I think it was all it was all fun. It was all in good fun and uh uh just great memories, you know, of, of him being, you know, who he was and who he really is. And I'm pretty sure that he is taking all of that experience uh being on the baseball field and being successful and all that work ethic and all that discipline and uh put it all into his uh, broadcasting career. And I think he's going to be just excellent. Another thing about him and, and yourself that, uh, you know, you two are in the same field on is you both played for the same organization your entire career. And Bernie, it feels like more and more and more that's becoming more rare. We, we really don't see that often. And uh, it feels like you two are kind of towards the end of that class that we used to see more often. And, and now we don't really. Do you think there's been a shift in the game of baseball? I don't want to use the term loyalty, but do you think there's been a shift in, in players' willingness to spend an entire career with one organization? Well, I think that it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, in, in other words, I think that uh, you sign with an organization – and you think, I think I thought, you know, for the most part that I was going to spend my whole career with that organization. And uh, you are right. The word is not loyalty because it does have a, a caveat. I mean, it, yeah. they're only loyal to you as long as you perform, exactly. <laughs> as long as you pray great. Exactly. You know, that, that is the, the kind of like the, uh, the enigma or the, uh, you know, the question that everybody has. Uh, there's also the people, uh, players are, kind of like figuring out that uh they are mini companies you know mini corporations and I, and I think that having the opportunity to look for the best opportunity for them to maximize their value not only as a baseball player nowadays but also as an entity you know as yeah. a public person as a public figure you know there's markets that are better for that than others you know obviously playing in New York you know will will have a great advantage you know in your career post baseball uh, yeah. also, you know, the fact that, uh, uh, it's, you know, players are really trying to maximize for the short amount, you know, in the scheme of the, the grand scheme of things, you have a limit, limited amount of time to play the game, you know, whether it's a year or 10 or 20, like some of these guys, if you're gonna depend on that, uh, income to last you for the rest of your life, you know, yeah. It's a big gap between the time that you retire and the time that you actually kick the bucket, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, you need to maximize your earning ability to the point that you don't have to worry about, you know, whatever team gives you that opportunity to maximize your value as a player, uh, uh, players are kind of going for that more nowadays, you know, and that's basically the value of a free agency. I agree wholeheartedly, especially in, in this day and age where you can have loyalty as a player, but the second those numbers on a piece of paper say something differently, that team will turn on you real quick and not want to sign you. And uh, yeah, I think it's important to realize, and I, I do think it's a good conversation uh, for those that might not understand is in the grand scheme of things, a playing career isn't very long. And this is what you've done your whole life. 
And I think you gotta, you gotta make your money while you can in a short amount of time, which it, it was interesting to me, Bernie, in 1998, you had a chance to, to sign elsewhere. And there were obviously a bunch of, of suitors for you and, and, and an incredible career. Ultimately, when it came down to it, was it an easy decision for you to sign back with the New York Yankees or was that a difficult process for you? Well, I think it was a difficult process because I think, you know, going back to the, that loyalty kind of aspect of the game, you figure in that you have given the organization everything that you can possibly give them. You expect a certain amount of uh, reciprocity, you know, back. And uh, the one thing that I did learn uh, through the whole process was not to take that in a personal way, you know. There's two parts of the game, especially if you're a professional player, most especially if you're a professional player, is the time that you are spending on the field with your teammates and playing the game that you play since you were a little kid. Uh, and uh, just having that, it, it is a blessing with it itself. Playing it at the, at the level that you're playing it and playing it you know, up to the best of your capabilities, playing Major League Baseball is the best. Yeah. However, the flip side of that is that there's always a business side of that aspect that you should not take personal because everything is, is, is on you know, a business decision we, in your part and the team's part. They, their responsibility to their fans and their stock, you know, the stockholders, you know, so to speak, is yeah. to give them the best product that they can have on the field. And if you're part of that equation, then you're great. So uh, as a player is not necessarily just kind of leaning on them to be, hey, I did that for you, did do that for me. It's just the attitude of, I'm going to try to make myself indispensable yeah, in a way that they cannot run their franchise without me as a player yeah. being part of it. And if you have that attitude, then everything else kind of falls in place because you've got a lot of questions answered, you know, and you actually can answer yourself a lot of these questions. Maybe I wasn't good enough to play for yeah. them. Maybe they made a, a business decision that it was in their best interest. So that, those are the two parts that you have to sort of figure out uh, and uh, make peace with both of them because they're both very important parts of your life and your career as a baseball player. Bernie, we, we might now in the game have the biggest free agent of all time and in, in Shohei Otani. And if you were in his shoes, uh, a guy that's, been with the Angels his entire career, not on a winning team his entire career, finally, as of a couple days ago, hits free agency. If you're in his shoes, what are you prioritizing heading into free agency where you could be making half a billion dollars? Well, I think there, uh, it, you know, when you utilize money in that way, uh, it becomes more than a commodity. <laughs> It becomes, you know, what you're using as your kind of like lever, your threshold, your, your, uh, I guess, indication that you are some of the best players in the, you know, in the world because you are commanding that salary. And, you know, to be quite honest, you know, there's some, you know, there's some amount of money that you need to live. <laughs> and then over that, you know, it is what it is. So once you reach <laughs> that level, you know, which is for whatever reason, it's different for every player, then you're not using money as a way to secure in your, your future. You're using money as a, as a lever to uh, just kind of like get your worth out yeah. there. It becomes a competition. So you figure, I think all of these guys that are doing, you know, these uh, going through this process, whatever they end up going for and whatever they end up getting is they're going to be set up for life. So that's not a question of, you know, uh, you know, how much money am I going to get? The question is, am I in the competition to be the best paid player? Yeah. And that's a completely different conversation because, yeah. uh, you know, it, it kind of has a repercussion on the rest of your career uh, and the opportunities that you're going to have after that. Uh, so I think, you know, we, he had to think, has to think long and hard because uh, even though money is really important, the conditions on on which you are working, the opportunity that you may have later in your career or in your career while you're signing to get to the opportunity to go to the playoffs and get a World Series ring, all of those factors come into play. You know, yeah. so if you're for, if you're Otani, you know he probably be, any team will be lucky to have him. So right. he needs to have an assessment of what is what are the teams that are available, willing enough to pay his salary. 
that are going to give him the best opportunity to be a successful player in the league, meaning not not uh, not the money, but just the opportunity to play and be yeah. actually make his mark in the game and, and make uh, maybe just get to the World Series, you know, a couple of times. Bernie, putting you on the spot here, where does your gut tell you that he's going to sign and where do you want him to sign? Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> I completely bias unimportant answer to this question, but I have no way of determining, you know, what his, uh, his, his thing is. I mean, he, he's coming from, you know, uh, you know, the, the East, you know, he has, he might have a, a great community of, of followers, you know, maybe in the, in the West coast, you know, going to maybe a team, you know, maybe staying in California, maybe going to Seattle, like, like maybe following the footsteps of, uh, you know, what, what Ichiro did in Seattle, uh, maybe going to, you know, maybe Vegas may give him an opportunity because, you know, he's over there. But I think at this point, he has sort of reached a level that any team will be lucky enough. Yeah. If they can afford him, you know, they're going to make sure that he is, you know, he is well taken care of. And I, I think he's, he can basically forge his future. I think at that point, it's just going to be, be a part of uh, the, the the conversation is going to be what team is going to give me the opportunity to win a World Series. Bernie, speaking of the New York Yankees, the current state of your former team and organization, what's going on there? Why why did we see them have a round of 500 season and, and one of the worst seasons we've seen from the Yankees in, in a long time? Well, I don't know. I, I think that may be a combination of factors. I don't think you can pinpoint uh, – you know, their performance and uh, the, what they have done in the last couple of years yeah. to just one particular thing. I think that, you know, over even even kind of going back to the time that I was playing in the early 2000s, when my career was, you know, sort of over, teams were gunning out for for the Yankees to beat them. And that was, you know, they kind of form a lot of their uh, institutions as far as the minor leagues, as far as, you know, building a core uh, and that, that was all taken out of, you know, the Yankee formula from the, you yeah. know, from the, from the nineties. Yeah. And now uh, you're seeing the result of that, uh, you know, approach where teams that have the luxury to spend 10 years forming a minor league system and building a core, have able to develop that core and putting them in the big leagues. And uh, that's what you're seeing right now. Uh, the Yankees don't have that luxury. The Yankees are always expected, at least in the time that I was playing, they were always expected to win. So they need to sort of sign people that, you know, are good players. But at the same time, the flip side of that is that you need chemistry. You yeah. cannot, it's been proven that if you have a team of all-stars, you know, if they don't get along, they're not going to go anywhere. Right. So you need to find that fine balance between veterans young players and have a core that is going to say, Hey, this is us and this is us against the world. And we're going to be here for the next five, 10 years, building this thing, building this culture in the clubhouse, which is, you know, why cat, you know, what Cashman and uh, Joe Torre and all those, those guys did, you know, as far as the organization. And I think a lot of team has, a lot of teams have taken that opportunity to rebuild. And now they're coming, you know, uh, into the scene, with uh, a very strong t teams, uh, the ability to get, you know, one or two pieces that can complement, you know, their efforts and to you know, have the opportunity to keep these guys, you know, yeah. if they choose to for a long period of time. Yeah. But one of the kids that I think is going to be a part of the Yankees organization for a long time to come is Jason D Dominguez. Bernie, this kid's a stud, and he showed that in his brief time in the big leagues. I know you spent some time with the Yankees uh, over the past few years of spring training and uh, throughout the course of the year, including with Jason Dominguez. How impressed are you by this kid and including what you saw in the big leagues from him in his short stint this year? Well, I am very impressed by uh, not only his physical ability, but his uh, poise, his mental attitude, his personality, the way that he doesn't really seem to be intimidated. Not every, you know, the, none of the big moments in his career, he is, you know, he has sort of felt like he's being overmatched. I mean, you talk about his first at bat in the big leagues against one of the best pitchers in his generation, you know, yeah. and I'm sorry to say that. Sorry I'm to well say aware. That. <laughs> I know. Uh, and what, what does he do? He hits a home run, you know, so uh, the whole package, you know, great arm, 
great uh, speed, great instincts on the outfield. Uh, but all of that, you know, could come and go. I think, you know, the most important uh, feature that I saw on him was his uh, his poise and uh, the fact that he was just acting like, not in a boastful way, but in a very humble way, acting like he be- that he belonged. You know, and he, you know, should have been given the opportunity a long time ago. He's taken full advantage of it. And uh, it was kind of hard to see him go through uh, what he yeah. went this year. You know, I think he would have been uh, in the running for rookie of the year had he not, you know, kind of uh, had that injury. Uh, but uh, I think this this is a, a, a team, a, a, you know, he is a player that you could build a team around. I think he, you know. He is going to give you what uh, what you need, you know, which is a very, very solid at the very least. He could be a superstar. But, at, yeah. you know, right now he is just a very, very solid uh, foundation for Trump, for a team to be to build to be built around him. And, uh, and Judge, I mean, you talk about two guys, you know, that are going to uh, be staples of that team, you know, hopefully in the next 15 to 20 years, yeah. if they stay healthy and they uh, perform to their to their uh, uh, expectations. Right. I feel like everyone needs somebody to, to put them under their wing when they come up as a rookie and kind of show them the ropes. Did you, is there somebody that sticks out for you? Somebody that really helped you in your rookie season? Uh, yeah, I, I could mention two people out of the many. I mean, that team, you only had to take a look around the clubhouse and uh, see how each of those individuals went about their business. And you could write a book about everybody, you know, and how to, you know, how to be successful and how to, you know, not only arrive, but remain uh, a very uh, prominent player, you know, but I think, you know, for my uh, experience, you know, two people, Don Mattingly, first and foremost, he was the captain before Derek became the captain. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was one guy that sort of shielded me from all the uh, sort of tough love that the old veterans, you know, were, you know, kind of like giving me and all the rookies, you know, in that time, uh, he was the guy that really spent a lot of his time and he didn't have to, but he spent a lot of time telling me, show me the ropes, you know, not only being a Yankee, you know, playing in New York, but all, also being a successful major league baseball player first and, you know, first and foremost. And uh, yeah. the other person that I would uh, probably mention would be Willa Randolph. Uh, yeah. uh, he was, I, you know, my first couple of years I played against him because he was still playing. Uh, but then he became a coach in the team, and uh, he was one of those guys that really believed in my ability to play the game and, and actually was very encouraging at times that I did not even believe in my own ability. He was like, in the first time I hit 300, he said, hey, this is just the way you roll, and don't let anybody tell you anything different, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just got to act like you belong because you do belong in this league, and you're going to put some good numbers. You know, you just got to keep working hard and then do what you're supposed to do. And that sort of gave me – uh, a lot of motivation because he was coming from two people that I really admired and that they really spent the time uh, making sure that I really knew all the information that I needed to know to be the player that I could be. Bernie, you've spent a, a good bit of time around the organization still and over the last few years. And and I want to ask, I don't know how well you know this guy, but he was the bench coach there for years, Carlos Mendoza, who is the new now manager for the New York Mets. One, did you get a chance to to get to know him? And and two, what can Mets fans look forward to their new manager? Well, I think he is going to be a guy that is going to be very, um, uh, very methodical. I think going from that uh, sort of school of uh, thought, you know, from, you know, uh, being like a young player, a young uh, mentor uh, involving analytics, I think he has all that information and has probably be able to make use of uh, that in a positive way uh i think he definitely has the capability of being a good manager and being in new york prior to becoming a manager he probably knows what to expect uh you know as far as the media demands and uh that you know what the city is going to demand from him uh so i think he's he, all these years that he spent with the yankees were great preparation for him to become the manager of the mets and i Definitely wish him, you know, the best uh, in, uh, in in that uh, endeavor. Speaking of guys you think have a good chance to become a, or has a chance to be a good manager, got to ask you about a fellow Puerto Rican, Yadi Molina. Do you see that guy being a big league manager? I feel like it's bound to happen. Well, you know, it, Yadi kind of reminds me because he actually grew up in the, in the same area that I grew up in Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, 
I, I think that he is going to be a good manager just by virtue of being a great catcher. Yeah. <laughs> you know, catchers by in, you know, by by default become great managers because they have a very unique perspective on the game, you know, seeing that from the, you know, from the position that nobody else sees the game from. <laughs> uh and uh, you know, speaking of that, you know, uh, uh a great mentor to the to the young people in Puerto Rico, uh, which you know, my my dad was also one of those guys that really mentored me in my career. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it was kind of sad to see my dad go, you know, you know, with, uh, with the disease that he went through and all that process. And, uh, but Yadi is, uh, just a great player. He comes from my part of town and I think he's going to be a, a, a great manager once he is given the opportunity. Uh, is, is Yadi a hall of famer in your opinion? No doubt. No doubt. I think he is. Uh, yeah. His numbers, you know, his longevity, the fact the fact that he uh, was a leader of that team and he was a, a part of a, you know, he was a winner, proven winner. You know, the team under his, you know, in his tenure won, you know, I think, I don't know how many World Series they won, but I, yeah. I know that he, they, they won a few. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think he is, you know, one that, you know, once all the numbers are all racked up and uh, 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 the dust settles, he, he definitely will have the, uh, all the, uh, the, the accolades, you know, to be a, to be a Hall of Famer. Bernie, you mentioned your your father. It's currently November, and November is National Caregivers Month. Can you talk about your journey as a caregiver for your father during the height of, of your baseball career and what uh, what you want people to know about IPF? Well, I, I'm so glad you asked, you asked me that question. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to tell this part of my, my life uh, that I'm spending really a, a lot of time uh, really, uh, as, as part of the, one of the, you know, some of the most important things that I do right now, uh, my dad uh, passed uh, away in 2001 from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It is one of the most common uh, uh, forms of IDL, which uh, means interstitial lung disease. Uh, he was the the hero of my family. Uh, he was the person that I really looked up to, uh, and uh, he started uh, having all these symptoms. You know, like uh, very. Uh, 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 tired at times, you know, a shortness of breath, you know, a dry cough that never, you know, got any better. And uh, we really spent a lot of time and effort, you know, trying to figure out what he was, uh, you know, what what he had. Uh, and it really, uh, we spent almost five years trying to get the right diagnosis uh, mm -hmm. when a doctor in Puerto Rico told us that he had IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is basically a scarring of the lung tissue that it makes it really difficult uh, to breathe. Uh, once we had that diagnosis, uh, we really had uh, knowledge of what was happening, but it was so late that we couldn't do anything uh, more to, you know, for him. And he ended up passing uh, maybe a couple of years after that diagnosis. Uh, but uh, uh, it has sort of given me the opportunity to uh, uh, just really raise awareness about this. And, uh, uh, you know, glad that you asked that. We have a uh, website uh, that is designed to raise awareness about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung diseases called Tuning to Lung Health, uh, which kind of deals with the power of music uh, to cope with uh, these diseases and the burden that these diseases cause. So uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about that. Of course. Thank you for, for sharing that. Can you talk about your work with uh, Bo Ringer Engelheim and the Tune Into Health program? Yeah, the Bo Engel, uh, Engelheim uh, is uh, the company that I paired with, you know, about seven yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we first started a campaign called Breathless, was basically uh, with this uh, purpose to uh, educate and raise awareness about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This has sort of evolved into... Uh, utilizing all the resources that we can to cope with uh, with the disease, and it sort of has evolved into tune into lung health, which I think is is wonderful because it really gives people an opportunity to utilize the power of music to cope with uh, with uh, the disease. And uh, uh, it's a, a great uh, website that has a lot of resources. You know, it, 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 that goes from even having a playlist of music that I kind of like help curate to uh, vocal and breathing exercises. When yeah. you're talking about taking a breath that everybody sort of takes it for granted. Uh, we uh, have uh, people with uh, uh, lung diseases that 
are have very a lot of difficulty taking a breath. So we have uh, breathing exercises curated by this uh, great uh, vocalist named Eric Vitro. Uh, we have information and, and comments from doctors, patients, and caregivers. Uh, so it's a, it's a great resource for people to know that they're not alone in this process and uh, to make sure that uh, they have somewhere to go to. So uh, tune in to longhealth.com. Yeah, that's really uh, that's really powerful stuff and, and really cool how it's like a combination of something you're very passionate about uh, due to your father and also music, which you uh, play now as well all the time, a, a great musician. And Bernie, I, I know I said it last time you were on, I got to get to a concert, my friend. I'm still I'm still dying to get to one and, and watch you play. Well, the more you 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 kind of delay that, the better I'm going to get as a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you get the best out of what currently happens in, in my guitar chops. But uh, yeah, I don't know if, I mean, if I said that before, but I had the great opportunity to uh, graduate from the Manhattan School of Music with a degree in jazz performance. And I've been, you know, like they say in New York, I'm just another cat looking for a gig down there. So it's, it's been amazing. <laughs> Uh, the opportunity to play with a lot of great people and uh, being, you know, sort of thought as not only a former baseball player, but you know, uh, uh, an aspiring uh, good musician, you know, solid in, in uh, you know, in the capital of the world. Bernie, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for hopping on here and talking a little baseball about your career and, and IPF and your father as well and, and everything involved there. So thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate it, man. Till next time, and God bless and all the best. Thank you. See ya. All right, just wanted to thank Bernie again for joining me. Always a lot of fun having him on. He's awesome and, and love sharing stories and, and love hearing his story and what he's currently doing as well. But uh, to me, what stuck out, where's Shohei going and where do you want him to go? The New York Yankees. Shocker there, uh, but always a really fun conversation with him. I hope you all enjoyed listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify. You can also watch everything, every episode on Spotify as well and YouTube. We're on TikTok at Flippin' Bats Pod for all of them. So thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. And uh, until next time, this has been another episode of Flippin' Bats.